you know, once we got to see how powerful these chemistries were, it naturally sort of fostered other ideas for how to use the chemistry. And so in my own lab, you know, we've used those reactions to make new kinds of chemically modified protein therapeutics, right? We make antibody drug conjugates using those chemistries. Hi, this is Professor Jed McCosco at Wake Forest University and at Academic Influence. And today I have an old friend from back in the California days uh, visiting us here on this show, Professor Carolyn Bertozzi, who's at Stanford University and is uh, rated highly both in biology and in chemistry. So I just wanted to ask you a little bit, do you remember sometimes referring to your research and the uh, the sugars on the outside of the cell as the peanut M&M? Was that one of your analogies that you used at one point? It sure is. And I still use it today. You know, I think it it's a great... I love that analogy. Yeah, it's, it's, it's something everybody immediately conjures up in their imagination when you say that. It's a common... You know, so so when did you get into studying the sugars on the outside of the cell? You know, I I started thinking about that area uh, in graduate school. So I I worked with a young carbohydrate chemist um, at UC Berkeley whose name was Mark Bednarski, and uh, he was my thesis advisor. And he had gotten interested in in sugars and glycobiology, as we call it, um, as a postdoc himself with George Whitesides at Harvard. So he kind of brought that sensibility into his brand new lab at Berkeley. And I was one of his first students. And he gave me some papers to read about sugars. And I just got hooked. It's so it's fascinating. So what were some of the most exciting discoveries you've made in your career? Just a couple of them. that, that and, and how did they go down? <laughs> um, well, you know, of course, the reality is that the discoveries are not really made by me. <laughs> the discoveries are made by my students and postdocs in the lab. Uh, and usually, um, if I'm lucky, when they get a their first hint of a discovery, they immediately come running to my office and show me the data. Nowadays, with COVID, they'll text me and email me. But, um, but some of the big moments of that type that I remember were, for example, the, the first time one of our so-called bio-orthogonal reactions worked on living cells. That was a kind of a big moment. And the student, I knew she was, yeah, she was doing the big experiment and it was a big question, would it work? And, um, and I knew she was doing the experiment that week, but I wasn't sure exactly when. And all of a sudden, one afternoon, she just kind of threw the door open to my office, carrying her ice bucket with tubes in it in one hand and the data printed out on the other hand. And she was covered in sweat because she had run into my office from a different building on campus. And, you know, Berkeley has a hill. So she had run up from the bottom of the hill to the top of the hill where the chemistry buildings are, soaked in sweat. And she said, she just looked at me with her big eyes and she said, it worked. <laughs> I was like, what worked? You know? <laughs> um, and all these other students started flocking in behind her. I guess the, you know, the energy was in the air. And um, so that was, that's the kind of moment that you just love, right? So she had, she had made this discovery that you can do chemistry on cells, and it was a big deal at the time. That That is an amazing story about a cool discovery and one that you had been building towards. It wasn't like she just randomly thought of something one weekend and tried it. You obviously had been putting the pieces together in your mind right. and had assigned her the project of trying it out. So yeah, even yeah. though she did the discovery, you were the one we had hashed it out. It, which well, is great. Mastermind, I think it would be a generous term. I think, you know, we like, you know, how it is with research projects, you hash it out late at night on some whiteboard in the hallway and and then you patch together, you know, what are the early experiments and you piece by piece build the molecules and test them in simple systems and then systems of higher complexity. So, you know, this had been going on for many weeks, sort of building up to this one really important experiment. But I've had now enough of those moments, right, with different students and different postdocs that I've gotten pretty good at seeing the moment where I know that that person, that that's going to be like their career. You know what I mean? I mean, I, I, I now can recognize when a student does a really critical experiment that's a really new thing kind of breaking some ground and i don't say it because it's a lot of pressure to put on somebody but i you know i can see the experiment i say that's your thesis project you know or i can say that's going to get you a job right that's your job right there yeah. that you know i, I can kind of see how that's it's going to unfold so exciting. yeah 
And do you sometimes see that with younger colleagues now that you're a more senior faculty member? Do you sometimes see a, a young assistant professor come in and when you hear about something they've done, you're like, that's going to get you tenure. Yeah. That's going to keep you here at Stanford or wherever you are. <laughs> yeah. I, sometimes. Yeah. Yep. That's exciting. Yep. Yeah, that's really exciting. Well, I do remember your lab there at Berkeley, and I know the hill that you, you're you talking about where your student had to run up the hill. Um, and, and it's exciting to think that uh, she got it to work. So what have you been able to do with these bio-orthogonal uh, reactions? And, and what kind of discoveries have you made in the biology world? That's a huge accomplishment for a chemist, but it's obviously very relevant in biology. So what, what have you been able to discover? Well, you know, I mean, the, the early days of our motivations for bioorthogonal chemistry were all centered around using those chemistries as tools to study the biology of sugars. And that student who made that big result, um, the implications of that result were that we could actually do imaging experiments to visualize the sugars on cells, both in a dish, but also in an animal, you know, to model different kinds of diseases, for example, in a mouse. Um, and so that was one of our early applications was for imaging of sugars in different settings and look at changes in their structures that correlated with a disease. So that's a very basic research type of application over the years, mm -hmm. you know, so course, go ahead. Yeah. You, you've applied it to, to uh, cancer. Sorry to interrupt you. You were going to go ahead. Yeah. So, you know, what, what started as, you know, a pretty focused application in imaging of sugars, you know, then two things happened. One is that, you know, once we got to see how powerful these chemistries were, it naturally sort of fostered other ideas for how to use the chemistry. And so in my own lab, you know, we've used those reactions to make new kinds of chemically modified protein therapeutics, right? We make antibody drug conjugates using those chemistries. Um, but then outside of my lab, you know, lots of other academic groups had their own ideas for how those chemistries could be useful, um, having nothing to do with sugars. Um, and now the biopharma industry has been using these chemistries to do target discovery and target validation. And, and most recently, people have made actual therapeutics where the bioorthogonal chemistry happens inside the human patient as part of a therapeutic treatment. Um, there's a company that I advise here in the Bay Area that's been doing bioorthogonal chemistry in humans to deliver drugs to the sites of a cancer. Uh, and they're in a phase one clinical study. So that's really fun to see that. That is so exciting. We've had a few Nobel Prize winners on this show. And do you think that uh, bioorthogonal chemistries are going to win a Nobel Prize at some point? <laughs> I, yeah, I couldn't even speculate. Um, but, I you think know, if, they if, might. if we I can mean, improve some human lives. Done so many things. <laughs> If we can, yes. if we can, if we can improve some human lives and some human health and, um, and help some patients, then I think, you know, that would be yes. a very satisfying outcome of, of all of my that would research. Be amazing. Yeah. And have, have, uh, COVID applications, um, been involved <laughs> in any of this research? Well, you know, um, like everyone, I think in the scientific community, once the pandemic started to rage and the global impact became more and more evident. Um, many of us want to deploy our skills right in some helpful way. Um, so yes, in fact, I, I have a, now a postdoc who works on SARS CoV-2 and he's using bioorthogonal chemistries to label the sugars that are on the spike protein. And of course the spike is the, the famous protein on the surface of the particle that gives it its spiky look, right? The corona. Um, but that spike is covered in sugars, and um, it turns out that we can put bioorthogonal chemical groups into those sugars, and this has allowed us to track the viral particles during infection studies. Um, so hopefully, you know, this will be yet another tool that researchers find helpful in their studies of, of COVID. That would be amazing. Wow. Well, it's really fun to hear all the things that you've been up to. Are there any things in the future that you and your lab are looking to do um, applications of sure. the research you're doing on the sugars outside of cells or, or anything? Yeah, well, you know, we've, um, I've started several companies from, you know, some of the basic science that started in my lab, but it, it got to the point where it was ready to kind of translate into a drug development process. Um, and, you know, my hope is that some of these technologies and some of the basic knowledge that we've learned using the technologies um, 
eventually progresses to make medicines for people. So, so I think, you know, if there's, if there's going to be a focus to the last part of my career and let's hope it's a big last part, um, I would like to see that it's, has a translational flavor to it. Um, that's the hope. That would be amazing. Well, thank you so much for taking time to share about your research and about your discoveries and the fun of being a chemist uh, with your foot firmly in the world of biology as well. So well, thank you, thank you so much, Professor. Oh, I appreciate Petosian. it. It was really fun to see you.